lovely web show folk to a very musical web show. We had Brian May in the past, so we thought it was time to bring another musical guest and a guest that I absolutely love and grew up with. And the whole kind of nostalgia thing is very important to us. Yes, we've focused on lots of movies that we love uh, through sort of de decades gone by, but we're also focusing on musical bands that are around then, still around today. You know, people that have kind of stood the test of time, but also have a very special place in our heart. And this next one has a special place in our hearts and a super special place in your heart, doesn't it? I grew up with Everclear. They were one of my absolute favorite bands. So I was so excited. And you probably guessed from the opening that Art Alexakis is the guest on this week's web show. They were huge in the 90s and the 2000s. They were on the Romeo and Juliet soundtrack. They were on Another Another Team movie soundtrack, which I absolutely loved, which was early 2000s. Um, they are still touring today. There's a new tour happening in July, the Summerland 2021 tour. Uh, we talk about that. Um, so I'm so excited that I'm Let's maybe just get straight into tour. it. Let's get straight into it. Art Alexakis. One of my favorite, genuinely favorite artists with responsible for some of my absolutely favorite songs. I'm so excited that Art Alexakis from Everclear is on the web show today. Art, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you again. Hasn't been that long because we've been locked down and I haven't been doing interviews. I feel like I saw you just yesterday when I interviewed you last. So that's how time flies when you're in a pandemic. I've never heard that. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> How time flies with your opinion. Did you just make that up? I did just then. That should be a book title. So excited to chat to you. Um, going back to when you were a little kid, dreaming of being a musician, being inspired, who inspired you growing up? Which artists did you listen to? I listened to a lot growing up, um, but the main influence about me wanting to pick up a guitar and do that, you know, what I saw was the Beatles. I saw I'm I'm old enough to have seen the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, not the first time they played because I was like probably eight months old. But in 66, when I was three and a half, four years old, uh, I used to sneak out of my bedroom at night after my mom put me to bed and I'd watch what they were watching behind the couch. Right. My mom and dad and one of my siblings would be out there, my parents smoking, you know, drinking coffee at nine o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> Those people were tough as nails. Um, and I saw on the Ed Sullivan show, I saw the Beatles the last time they played. And I remember just losing my mind as a I was I was in my jammies, you know, I was like four. And I just ran to the movie to the TV screen and just tried to touch it and just it was uh, ever since then I've worked at jobs, I've went to school to do different things, but there's nothing I ever really wanted to do but play guitar and sing in a rock and roll band. Be careful what you ask for, right? So when you had that moment that you knew that that's what you wanted to do, how hard was that journey to get from that dream to that first record deal? It doesn't really look good on a resume to say, yeah, you know, after I get done doing, you know, being a drug dealer like I am right now, I think I want to play in a rock band. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, rough. It's rough. My mom, my poor mother, you know, my dad left when I was young and I got, I was raised by my mom who, uh, big shout out to single moms. Um, you know, that she taught me how to be a man. Uh, all the good things, all the bad things I picked up on my own. Um, but I just, I learned, one of the things I learned from my mother is tenacity and to be able to listen to people, but not really pay attention to them if they're, what they're telling me is what I don't want to hear, you know? And it, it was, it was rough. It was rough. I learned, I started playing guitar when I was 14, started singing when I was 20, writing songs when I was 20. Um, by the time I was 23, 24, I was, I was, I was, you know, singing and playing in my own bands and my songs that I've written. And that's where it started. And one of the things when I spoke to you and interviewed you for Icon that I still stuck with me and I really loved was how passionate you were about retaining the creative control of your album covers, your image, your music. Um, how, why was that so important to you and how hard was that to keep? 
aside from being a control freak, you know, um, I think what it comes down to is I grew up in L.A. and I saw people getting signed left and right in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, the new wave boom and stuff. And and it always seemed like the, the bands that held on to their beliefs not just bands, but people in life that held on to their beliefs of how they th thought it should be in their vision. They're the ones that were more successful or at the day, at the end of the day, more um, accepting of the fact that they weren't successful because they did it their way. They gave it their best shot and they were able to go, just wasn't in the cards, right? But when you give someone else that power and that control, you never really know for sure if... Um, if you did it your way, maybe it would have worked. And I never wanted to be that guy. So I've just been, a, uh, like, like I told you before, the first time we talked, I'm a veritable hard ass when it comes to me doing things my way. Now, if I'm collaborating with someone or I'm in a relationship, I'm hundred percent cool with doing things our way or even your way, if it makes you happy. But when it comes to my band and my, my vision and my creative stuff, uh, I I tell that to people. I life coach. I'm I'm a, I'm a few months away from being a certified life coach and uh, certified to work with uh, drug and alcohol dependent people, being clean and sober for 32 years. But I'm also uh, finishing my certification. This is something I want to do. I want to start coaching and being a therapist for for creative people. It's called coaching for creatives, and um, it's probably going to kick in next year. And I want to work with creative people, people who are in the grind on their way up, people who are, have success and, and fame. I can relate to all those things, you know, and I can be a good sounding board and a good coach for that. When did you make the decision to that you wanted to do that? I've been wanting to do that for a long time. People have been pushing me into like asking me to life coach or sponsor them in meetings because, you know, I go to 12 step meetings I have for 32 years. and. Uh, it's something that people have said that it's something that I'd be good at. And it's something that I like to do. I, but I think in this last year of COVID, it's funny you ask, I think it really became obvious to me that I want to do something with my life where I'm giving back. I need to give back more. And I, I feel like I give back with my music and with, with Everclear and with the things we do and we, we raise money for people. And we've always been really good about that. I've always been really good about that. But for the next chapter of my life, I still want to play in Everclear and do that. But I, I want to do this as well. And I want to give back all these lessons I've learned, all these mistakes I've made. Other people can learn, learn from my mistakes. Don't do that. Learn from my mistakes. I think everything happens for a reason. And if this is your purpose, that you had to go through all of that to help people, then it was yeah. worth going through. Exactly. Love that a pandemic helped you realize that as well and something good came out of this crazy year. A lot of bad things came out of the pandemic. Let's let's not kid ourselves, but a lot of good things came out of it too. I had to spend a lot of time with my family. I, I got back into going to meetings online and, and therapy online and I feel stronger than I have in years. COVID was hard. It, I was in bed for two week, two months, um, and I have I have multiple sclerosis. I think we talked about it a little bit before, um, so that made it even harder. Um, still hard, but I, I you know it's in my life, and I I've said this many times before. Nothing good in my life has come easy. So if there's a challenge there, to me there's opportunity for something big to happen. I remember reading when you made your um, MS announcement, how many people it seemed to touch and they connected with it and it, it almost helped them. So you, I imagine you had quite a, a great response from people sharing their stories and, and connecting with you on that. Absolutely. I mean, I put it out before, I, I, I didn't go to like, we didn't put out a press release. I just put it out on my, social media letter I wrote. And I'm not kidding you. I got over 100,000 responses. And that's not counting how viral it went. I think over 
2 million people saw it. You know, you can tell how many people actually put eyeballs on it. It was a feature in Rolling Stone, Billboard, Variety, US Today, or People. I think it's something that it connected with a lot of people that had it and kind of were in the shadows about it, you know? They didn't want people to look down on them because I, I, to me, it's, and anything that you do that is hard in life and you do it anyway, that's what bravery is all about. Bravery is not about being scared. Uh, or not being scared. It's about being scared and doing it anyway. It's about being intimidated, but doing it anyway. It's about knowing that it's going to be adversarial and ridiculously tough to do, even if it's just walking through the airport. For me, walking is hard. It's not incredibly hard, thank God, knock on wood, yet, but it's, it's difficult. And I am... I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the challenges because that's what makes us makes us better, makes us stronger. Some of your songs, I mean, a lot of your songs are incredibly and deeply personal that when you wrote them. Um, how hard are songs like that to write? And do you kind of approach them that it's almost like an internal therapy just for you? Or do you write them knowing that perhaps it can connect and help people who are going to hear them? Yes, 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 and yes. So I do look at it as catharsis. Um, to a certain extent, they are they are hard to write. Um, people get the idea that all my songs are autobiographical. They're not. I'd say about 30% of them are. Another 30% are stories where I take things that happen in my life or uh, people I know's life or things I read about and create. Um, uh, I create char characters and amalgams and stuff. And then Another 30% is just me writing, just writing, just creating stories, you know? And I think a good writer can do all three of those. And if you have a hard time telling which is which, I'm doing my job. I do sometimes have a hard telling which is which. Everybody does. I had a drummer who was in my band, thought that my mom had died, like in the song Queen of the Air from, you know, and he's, he played drums on the record. And he's like, man, I'm sorry to hear about your mom. I'm like, and my mom lives like 50 miles away. I got, she's, I got to go over there and pick her up, take her to church tomorrow. You know, and, and he's like, what? I go, yeah, man, it's, I just got the title Queen of the Air off a book. And I didn't even know what the book is about. And I just wrote a story. And what is your creative process for songwriting? Do you, does every song kind of happen the same? Or do you, does it just surprise you when it comes up? I have different processes, to be honest with you. And when I work with people, and I, and I work with people on songwriting, I, I go through my various processes. And basically, a lot of times I'll get an idea about something I want to write about, and I'll just write. I'll just write ideas. Just write two paragraphs, three paragraphs, a paragraph, whatever. And then I'll let that sit and simmer. And then I'll, if I'll go through it and look at it and see if there's any poetic lines in there and take those out. And then, you know, I've got different processes. Sometimes I write the music first. Sometimes I write the song, the lyrics first. Sometimes it's just the melody and I break, I bring everything up over around that. Or sometimes it's just the title. There's different ways to do things. I try to write songs in different ways and different processes so that they don't all sound like the same song. And your songs have been featured in countless soundtracks. For me, Romeo and Juliet is the most iconic and brilliant. It's in my car at the moment. I'm listening to it. Um, what does it mean for an artist when your song is featured as part of a film? And do you get any creative say in how it's used? It doesn't really happen that much anymore. It, happens, it happened more in the 90s, the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s. Um, but since uh, people have been... You know, since Napster, uh, they just don't pay that kind of money to do that kind of, to, to do songs like that. And they don't give uh, the artist much uh, creative uh, wherewithal at all. So I haven't written for a movie in a long time. They'll use old hits and stuff, but that they just go through my publishing company for that. But back in the day, like, um, especially that song, uh, it's called Local God. I was approached by Baz Luhrmann's people because Baz was a fan. He was an Australian and we were really big in Australia. And uh, 
he uh, was, uh, he wanted me to write a song. And they sent me the, um, you know, the scene that they wanted me to write for. And so I could get the rhythm of it. And it's funny because earlier that day, I was in New York with my wife and daughter, and I had been in Macy's department store. And over the the speakers of the store, they were playing like uh, underground drum drum and bass type stuff. And I was like, I really love the minimalism and space of that. And I went back uh, to the hotel to get dressed to go to the MTV Awards. And I saw the email from Baz and I just sat down with my acoustic guitar and came up with this riff and this idea to do the bass first. And then I had these lyrics about, you know, do that stupid dance for me. Um, and uh, looking at being a Romeo as a, as a dance, like relationships as a dance. And that's, that's, that was the basis for it. So that after that, it was just kind of fill in the dots, you know. You say it so casually, just filling in the dots to create such an iconic song. I say filling in the dots, that makes it sound a lot easier than it is. But once you get the idea, once you know where you're going, it's easier to get there, right? If you're just out driving aimlessly, that's great too. But if you're trying to get somewhere, you have to know where you're going. That's why a lot of people love GPS now, because no one gets lost, <laughs> or it's harder to get lost, you know? And I re I resisted that of typical stupid American male, and I resisted that for years. Oh no, I know how to, you know, I know directions. I know where my north is, and you know what? I use GPS every time I leave the house, pretty much now. I used GPS yesterday and got lost four times. You get lost with GPS. <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> you and me, I think sometimes put the whole blonde thing. We give we give our our enemies a, a little you know, am ammunition. And I'm not even a real blonde. You're a real blonde. I'm a police blonde. And, uh, but I, I get there. It's lighter than natural blonde. Um, you have just announced your 2021 Summerland tour, which is very exciting. Hopefully travel opens up and I can come to the States. Um, it's Everclear, Living Color, Hoopstank and Weedus, if I have that right. Um, I bet you're incredibly excited to go back on tour. I believe you open in Boston in July 1. Uh, can you talk a little bit about it? I'm very excited for this tour. I'm a huge fan of Living Color. I've met them a couple of times over the years and just, you know, even at my age at 59 and, you know, the success I've had, I still fanboy when I get around those guys. Um, and Huba Stank is a band I, I've loved. I've seen them live. They're great and they're great people and they've got great songs. And Weedus is just super unique, super fun people are going to get blown away by how good they are live and how good their songs are. So um, I'm really excited for this tour. Uh, it came together. Like I think all good, really good things. It came together pretty easy. You know, a lot of times trying to get bands to work together. It's a lot of babysitting and a lot of like, well, I don't want to go in after them. And, and uh, they can't play this song because it sounds too much like this song. I'm like, get over yourself. You know, I got to start using my life coaching skills and just like, so how do you feel about this? You know, but a lot of times I just want to be like, shut the hell up and just go out and play your music. Stop, stop, just go play. So did that lineup happen quite organically? Good word. It, it pretty organically. I just got new glasses and it's a new prescription. So it's really strong. So I, I have to give my eyes a break every now and then. But um, yeah, it came together pretty well. And I think... A lot of times the good things do. You don't have to fight too hard for it. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Like relationships. If there's a lot of filing, fighting early on. It's not a good sign. In 2019, you released your first solo album. I picked this up when I saw you in North London in 2019. End of 2019 now. At the solo tour, yeah. Brilliant. Loved it. Um, do you have any plans to release another solo album or is there something in the works with Everclear? Right now I'm, I'm, I'm working on going to school and, and uh, getting my certification and getting that going. But 
there has been talk about doing um i've been thinking about doing a like a just a old school power pop record just doing it quickly writing the songs working them out going in the studio kind of like our first album world of noise took like what 10 days do it in 10 days if i can do a record 10 songs in 10 days that would be awesome i'm starting to play with that idea actually on my desktop i've got two songs i'm working on i got titles and some lyrics and already working on riffs so i'm getting into the into the mood to write again but i'm also working on a book a memoir i think we talked about that um when we met before so I've got, I've got a lot of you know a lot of balls in the air right now but i'm starting to think about making a record i'm not going to promise it but i'm thinking about it what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given don't give up if you want it bad enough don't give up have tenacity my mother taught me tenacity um be your own biggest cheerleader all at the same time which is which is a hard road to hoe it's a hard line to balance you need to be able to criticize yourself more than anyone else because no one knows you or what you do better than you you know when you do something great you know when you miss the mark you know when you can do better regardless of what other people say people want to tell you what they think you want to hear the inner voice tells you what you need to hear you will be a really great life coach that was <laughs> you want to demo me a little money <laughs> I'll be your first client, sign me up. If you could go back to when you signed your first record deal, knowing what you know now, would you change anything about your musical career and your journey? I would. But I don't necessarily want to talk about the things that change, but I would have made some choices early on that if as a life coach for working with guys in bands or people in bands, not just guys, people, um, in bands, um, I would advise them not to do a lot of the things I did, not to sign contracts that I signed, um, and to be smarter about it and be more like I I in like I went through bankruptcy and lost uh, the the publishing to my big songs. I'll never have anything from those ever again. And if I had made different choices earlier. That wouldn't happen if i had been advised better that wouldn't happen and i hope that i can advise people somewhere down the line to be smarter about that but yeah there's changes i've made there's changes i make in my personal life i wouldn't have been married three times i've been married twice the two times i had kids you know what are you most proud of of to date in your career or your life i guess that, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm proud of the success of the band. I'm, I'm proud of myself for being sober for as long as I have, uh, dealing with my anger and rage and my promiscuity and uh, my all my addictions, alcohol, drugs, sex, the whole thing that, you know, th th it's, it's not, there's, it's not, um, it's not a mystery why I've been married four times. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made bad choices. And, but I'm proud of myself because I've learned from those choices. And a lot of people never learn. And, but I'm really proud of my daughters. I'm proud that they're strong young women who are doing things their way. And they don't have the a lot of the baggage I've had. And I'm, I'm proud that I've been able to be a part of that. Well, it's been absolutely just, again, an absolute honor to talk to you. I am a huge fan. Um, July 1, the tour starts, Everclear Music website, all the details are on there. Um, I do genuinely hope I get to come out and the borders open up and I can come and see you again live. I just think you're wonderfully talented and incredibly inspirational. So thank you so much for chatting today. Well, it was wonderful seeing you again. Thank you for taking time and I hope you can make it out. Uh, but if you can't, we are working on a possible UK tour in, of Everclear in 2022, if we can make that work. We'll see. I'll be there with bells on. 
hope you enjoyed that really, really lovely chat. Well, how nice What a lovely you? guy. What a lovely guy. It's so nice when you finally get to speak to people that you've held in such high esteem for so long and they turn out to just be really, really lovely people. Can't gush enough about how wonderful he is. Um, highly recommend Sun Songs, which is his solo album that we spoke about. Um, you can get that and all their other albums, their amazing albums on everclearmusic.com. And that is where they have all the information of the Summerland 2021 tour. So hopefully we can get out to the States and enjoy one of the concerts. But as you said, maybe an Everclear tour in the UK next year. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Now, we'd love to hear from you guys about people you might like us to interview. We've obviously got a, you know, a lot of people that we're planning on interviewing, loads of great more shows coming up. But why don't you comment down below? Maybe there's somebody that you'd really like to see. Maybe there's a film that you're really interested in. Maybe there's something. The channel is for the community. So please like, subscribe, comment down below, get engaged and tell us what you like. See you next time. <laughs>